Welcome to the Nebraska State Park Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of each month. A detailed schedule for this series as well as information about all of the Historic Society's programs and services can be found on our website, which is nebraskahistory.org. My name is John Lindahl. I'm in statewide services here at the Museum of Nebraska History. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to broadcast these programs to a large audience on public access television. Today's speaker is Greg Miller, preservation historian from the Society's Historic Preservation Division. His topic is Old Balti, also known as the Tower, which is a unique geological feature in Nebraska. Please welcome Greg Miller. Thank you. And the top is the tower. Uh, the contemporary name that we, that's used today is Old Baldy, but historically um, the feature is called the tower. It's a unique site. Uh, first documented by Lewis and Clark on their journey westward. Uh, before we get to Lewis and Clark and the tower, a little background about how they got there. In 1783, treaties were signed between England, France, Spain, and the newly created United States. For the United States, these treaties ended the war with England, uh, recognized the United States independence, and established the boundaries of the United States. And the boundaries would be this, the green area right there. Those were the new boundaries. And people quickly began moving from the East Coast across the Appalachians into the new western area. And uh, in, about, in 1800, there were nearly a million people west of the Appalachian Mountains and go going up towards the Mississippi River. The federal government, in fact, encouraged this kind of settlement in this area. Uh, but the settlement brought new problems with it. And one of the main concerns was navigation on the Mississippi River. Because once you got west of the Appalachian Mountains, the main way to stay in contact with and to communicate with people in the east was by going down the Mississippi River uh, and then going around Florida. Because in 1800, there were only three roads that went over the Appalachian Mountains. So the fear was that if uh, if they could not use the Mississippi River, then they would lose contact with the people in the east. And the reason that there was some concern about this is originally this brown tan area here, the Louisiana Purchase Territory, was owned by Spain. And around 1800, the settlers' worst fear happened when Spain cut off navigation rights. They, they owned the Mississippi River. They owned the Mississippi River from the east bank onwards. And they arbitrarily said that the, people, the U.S. citizens in the West could no longer navigate the Mississippi. And also, they said that they could not have a right of deposit in New Orleans, which means that even if you could take your goods to New Orleans, you couldn't leave them, up, leave them there for another ship to pick up. So the people in the West were really now cut off from the people in the East. Also during this time, 1800, 1802, then Spain ceded the Louisiana Territory to France, and it appeared that France was going to continue with this uh, same policy of not allowing United States citizens to navigate the Mississippi River or have the right to deposit in New Orleans. Well, at this time, 1800, Thomas Jefferson was elected president of the United States. And he saw the seriousness of the situation. So he sent Robert Livingston and James Madison to, uh, to France to try and purchase just New Orleans. That, that was their instructions that he had given them. So when they get to France, they meet the French foreign minister. Uh, the French foreign minister instead makes an offer and says, I'll tell you what, you can buy New Orleans, and, but at the same time, you have to buy the rest of the Louisiana Territory. Well, Livingston and Madison didn't have instructions to do that, but at the same time it seemed like too good of a deal to pass up. So they said, okay, we'll, we will buy the whole territory. And the uh, asking price was $15 million, so they signed the document. And so for $15 million, the United States purchased the Louisiana Territory along with New Orleans. And that, that treaty was ratified in the Senate 
in October of 1803. So now the United States owns the Louisiana Territory, and it's the whole of the Mississippi River and its western tri tributaries east of the Continental Divide. This new territory covered about 828,000 square miles, and what this did is it doubled the size of the United States. So now they have a whole bunch of new territory out there, and, but they didn't know what was in it. And so there was just this new territory just begged to be explored. So Jefferson had already had intentions of exploring this territory, um, and he had the finances appropriated for it. And so now he says, okay, let's get, now we do own the territory. We don't have to ask Spain's permission. We don't have to ask Fran France's permission. We own it now. Let's just go ahead and go through with the ex expedition, and they will. And he had several um, items that he wanted the expedition to achieve, several missions. And one was, uh, it was scientific. He wanted to, the, he wanted the expedition to explore and to collect and describe plants and animals new to science, uh, accurately record the latitude and longitude of the rivers, mountains, and other features, uh, note the climate, the water supply, the timber, and follow the, Missis follow the Missouri and its tributaries to their heads, and then locate rivers flowing down the west side of the Rocky Mountains into the Pacific. And this last in initiative of following the Missouri to, to the headwaters and then going to other waters flowing down on the west side of the Rocky Mountains uh, fit in real nice, nice with his second purpose, and that was to find an all-water route from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean. And the reason that he was so excited about this prospect was that this would facilitate trading opportunities that Jefferson expected the United States would realize from the new territory. And this, of course, will not happen, but they didn't know that at the time. And finally, the leaders of the expedition were to assure the Native American tribes that they encountered along the way, uh, including the tribes outside of the territory, Louisiana Territory, because this expedition's going to continue all the way to the West Coast. The Louisiana Territory stops here, but they're going to continue on. So he wanted the leaders of, of, of the expedition to meet with uh, the Native American tribes and uh, explain to them that the, United, that the United States government would be a good friend and a protector as well. So he has his plans for the expedition, and they have the money for the expedition. Now they have to put the people together for the expedition. And to lead the expedition, he chooses his private secretary, Meriwether Mary Lewis. Uh, this is a picture of Meriwether Lewis. He's a young Virginian with considerable service with the Army, serving in the West, so he knows a lot about ter uh, Western territories and has been exploring with the military, so he's, this is not going to be something that's new to him. And according to Jefferson, Lewis also possessed a great mass of accurate information on all the subjects of nature. So not only is he familiar with uh, travel in the West, exploration in the West, but also uh, he's going to be able to identify and record any new scientific flora fauna uh, uh, finds that they make. Well, they needed someone else to go along with. They needed another leader to go along with them. And Lewis chose William Clark. And an image of, Lewis, of William Clark as their co-leader. Uh, he, he was also a military man who had experience in negotiations with Native American tribes and also in land surveys. So they had different, they had, uh, different qualities that would mesh together and allow them, allow this uh, uh, expedition to work pretty smoothly. Together then, they enlisted another 45 men, and these 45 men spent, a spent were encamped near St. Louis over the winter of 1803, 1804, and then on 1804, May 14, 1804, these explorers, the 45 men and Lewis and Clark, collect collectively they're known as the core of, of uh, discovery, they set out on their journey. And the main means of travel was going to be a 55-foot keel boat. And this is their drawing of the keel boat. It has sails. I'll show you a, a bigger image in just a second. It has sails. It has oars, as you can see here. And also, it had poles to push it with. 
and they had ropes for pulling because they're going to be going up the Missouri River. They're going to be going upstream against the current. So they, had, they could use the wind when possible, but they're going to be rowing a lot. Uh, they're going to be using poles to push the boat a lot. And when all else fails, they're going to use ropes and pull the boat along uh, the Missouri River. Uh, accompanying the keel boat then are also two dugout canoes called P-Rows. They're lar larger canoes. Uh, and the plan called for the entire Corps and the three boats to go up the Missouri River. And, oh, here's the other. This is the picture of the keel boat. This is a little bigger th than the one that Lewis and Clark had, but it gives you an idea of what it, of what it looks like. So the plan called for the entire Corps and the three boats to go up the Missouri River. And they were going to go to where they're going to set up their winter camp at the Mandan uh, Native American village near present day North Dakota. Uh, this shows where they're going. They're leaving St. Louis. And they're going to go follow up the Missouri River up towards Vermilion and continuing to follow the Missouri River up to up the very top, Fort Mandan. And that's where they're going to have their winter camp. The, following, the plan was for the following spring, one contingent made of 16 members of the, of the Corps of Discovery would return to St. Louis in the keel boat. And they're going to take with them any specimens of plants and animals new to science. The remaining 29 men, along with Lewis and Clark then, would continue on their, ver on their voyage or on their trip to the Pacific Coast where they again would establish a winter camp and then return the following year. This entire trip, starting on May 14, 1804, lasted until September 23, 1806. So it's about 28 months that, they'll be, that this entire voyage lasts. And this really was tr a truly remarkable trip. They crossed mountains that, that were greater or larger than any Euro-American had ever seen on this continent. They witnessed magnificent waterfalls, raging rivers. They encountered numerous Native American tribes. And they discovered and recorded vast quantities of flora and fauna that were new to American science. Now, throughout this lengthy journey, there's one region in particular where these discoveries were most numerous, where they found most of the flora and fauna. Uh, and it's called the High Plains region. And it extends roughly from the 98th parallel to the foothills of the Rockies. And then uh, north to south from Canada down to Mexico and the Gulf. And when Lewis and Clark passed the confluence of the Missouri and Niobrara River, Missouri. down here, when they passed the confluence there, they had crossed the 98th parallel. So they're in the High Plains region at that time. And their journey from the north of the Niobrara to the beginning of the Teton River, which is near present-day Pier, South Dakota, right here. So they're going to travel from here up to here. For that part of the journey, it took them about 20 days from September 4th to September 24th. And it covered about 263 miles. And it was during these 20 days that Lewis and Clark discovered several species of animals entirely new to the scientific world. It was also on this leg of the journey that William, that William Clark made one of only a few journal entries noting an unusual geologic feature. And this is, this is true not only of just of this region, but of, of the entire journey out west and back. So this is one the journey, journal entry that he's going to make that we're going to talk about to some extent, is only one of a few that he makes on the entire trip. And this particular entry, of course, describes the tower. And when they, dis when they, find, when they discover the tower, when they come across the tower and they go to explore it, they're also going to find a zoological discovery, which will be new to science. This is the Missouri River. And this is the pretty much what they're going to see is they're coming down from east to west. This is the view they get. Actually, this view is taken from near the top of the tower today. And so this is the view that you get. And you can see that it goes quite a ways down there. They can see quite a ways. And I'm going to read you just a little bit about the 
from the journal entry uh, that he made on the day that they went to see, on the day that they saw the tower. Well, they saw it the day before, but the day that they stopped and visited the tower. And the uh, entry goes, a very cold morning, set out at daylight. We landed after proceeding five and one-half miles near the foot of a round mountain, which I saw yesterday resembling a dome. And so obviously he could see that. It's up high enough that he could see it at least five and a half miles away. Captain Lewis and myself walked up to the top, which forms a cone and is about 70 feet higher than the highlands around it. And that's a picture of the tower today, the one on the left. The base is about 300 feet high. In descending this cupola, discovered, discovered a village of small animals that burrow in the ground. Killed one and caught one alive by pouring a great quantity of water in his hole. We attempted to dig to the, be to the beds of one of these animals. After digging six feet, found by running a pole down that we are not halfway to his lodge. The village of those animals covered about four acres of ground on a gradual descent of a hill and contains great number of holes on the top of which those little animals set erect making a whistling noise and when alarmed step into their hole. We poured into one of the holes five barrels of water without filling it. These animals are about the size of a small squirrel, shorter, longer, and thicker. The heads much resembling a squirrel in every respect except the ears which is shorter, his tail like a ground squirrel which they uh, shake and whistle when alarmed. The toenails, long, they have fine fur, and the longer hairs is gray. It is said a kind of lizard, also a snake, reside with those animals, did not find that this correct. And he ends by saying that they camped there at near the tower uh, that night. And on this journey, Lewis kept a, on this journey, Lewis kept a journal, Clark kept a journal, and the sergeants on the trip also kept a journal. So there are, nem there are no several journal entries referring to the tower. Uh, this is the only one that, that Lewis or Clark wrote about. And the other journal entries are very similar to what uh, Clark said in, in, his, in this entry. So this is the only entry by either Lewis or Clark concerning this event. Still, on closer examination, the importance of this event in the context of the Corps' entire westward journey across the high plains is pretty apparent because he talks about a number of things here uh, which I'll explain in just a second. A closer view of the tower. When they first planned their trip, Clark was trying to figure out, uh, because he is familiar, more familiar with land surveys and such, he was trying to figure out how long it would take to get from their camp in St. Louis to the Mandan village where they're going to have their uh, winter camp. And as he was figuring this, he thought that he initial, initially decided that they'd have to make a, min a minimum of 10 miles per day. And initially the expedition was able to maintain this pace of going 10 miles per day. However, after Lewis and Clark began to encounter Native American tribes uh, w with the resulting councils that lasted at least two days, the Corps quickly fell behind their schedule. Now, meeting the Native American tribes, that was one of their missions, and so that's something they were required to do by the president, meet with the Native American tribes, and, and when they met with them, this was all new to a lot of the Native American tribes, and the Lewis and Clark were supposed to learn as much as they could. So they, again, these councils would go on for two, three, maybe four days, and as they did, then, of course, they got further behind because they're supposed to be making 10 miles a day, and they can't make that when they're having their council. So the Corps quickly fell behind schedule. But even as this becomes more, even as time becomes more precious, because again they have to get to the Mandan villages uh, before winter sets in. So even as time becomes more precious, again another view of the tower, the one on the left. Even as time becomes more precious, and they need to continue to achieve the minimum num number of miles per day, they still made a conscious effort to only go five and a half miles to look at this geologic feature. So as they were traveling down the Missouri River, they saw this, and they knew it wasn't 10 miles, or they found out it wasn't 10 miles. So they go, they stop after five and a half miles, and they want to, and this is such an astounding feature, they want to stop and look at it. So they make a conscious effort. 
to not go the entire 10 miles. So they stop, and they, again, a very unique geologic fi feature. And as noted by Clark, the tower was 70 feet higher than the ground around it. Now, as you can see, uh, because of the erosion, it's not, it doesn't sit up as high as it used to. But according to Clark's description, this, is, this would have been 70 feet higher than any of the other surrounding bluffs and hills that you see there. Also, the other thing that makes the geologic feature so uh, outstanding is the lack of vegetation. And this is a result of the tower's geologic composition. Because of the, because of the geology of the rock, vegetation doesn't grow on it, which is another thing that's going to make it stand out from the rest of the surrounding terrain. So as noted, after, after, so they climb up the tower. And as they descend the tower then, Lewis and Clark come upon a prairie dog town. And this is a prairie dog town that exists there today. So they come, they come down the tower, and they find a prairie dog town. And this animal was previously unknown to scientists. And there's the prairie dogs. Not the same ones, but prairie dogs. <laughs> So again, this animal was previously unknown to scientists. And they get a detailed description, the one that I just described to you, and they're able to get this detailed description because, in part, they shot and killed one, so they knew what it looked like, but they also captured one. So they wanted a live specimen as well. So to achieve this, the men began digging. And of course, they dug down, as I said, six feet and stuck a pole down, and they found out they were still a long way from getting to the beds in a pretty elaborate tunnel system. So they thought they'd try to drown one out, and they did. And the, all the members of the Corps participated in this, except for one member who was left to guard the boat. So they had 46 people involved in this operation. And what they did is they took barrels of water, hauled it from the river to the Prairie Dog Town, and started pouring water down, trying to flood it out. And this is a picture just of two holes, and this is why it's so difficult for them to get the ground, to get the prairie dog out, is because you can see they have a hole, another hole, and they're, you know, they go in one, the tunnel system allows them to go out another one, so it's very difficult. So they start pouring barrels of water down, and finally, at the end of the day, they catch the prairie dog that they wanted. Well, so they captured a live one, and they, and they keep it with them. The next day, September 8th, so what's happened now, they traveled the five and a half miles with maybe the intention of looking at the tower, scaling up the tower, measuring its dimensions, and then getting back in their boats and going. But after finding the zoological feature, the prairie dog, they, they spend the entire day there. So now they are, again, behind schedule. But they think this is unique enough and special enough that they're willing to lose that time to investigate this area. So then on the next day, September 8th, they broke camp. And they continued their journey westward, going along the Missouri. However, because of the zoological and the geological discoveries they found the previous day with the prey dog in the tower, Lewis and Clark proceeded with unusual intense, with an unusually intense exploration of the area. And the example of this, and this is again through the journals, as you read through the journals, this doesn't happen in any other part of the journey except here. Because normally what happens is Clark will stay on the keel boat. And he, because he's, again, because of his land survey knowledge and navigation experience and such, he'll stay on the keel boat and guide the keel boat. And Lewis, uh, because of his knowledge of the nature and, and flora and fauna and such, he would walk along. But because of the unusual features that they found here and in anticipation of finding additional features, flora, fauna, geologic, uh, features, both Lewis and Clark walk the land. They walk separately. They're walking on different sides of the river. They're walking away from each other. But they're walking. Diff they're both walking, which again is unusual as you read through these journals because you just don't see this happening. And so uh, they're both walking along while the other, while the sergeants man the uh, keelboats and the piros. So. They, they're going to continue their journey up, and they do reach the Mandan villages uh, before winter, winter sets in in 1804. 
But let's go back to the prairie dog for a second because he has a pretty interesting story himself. They take the prairie dog with them up to uh, the Mandan villages uh, and they keep him over the winter. In the spring of 1805, as was the plan, uh, 16 members of the Corps of Discovery are going to go back to St. Louis and Clark Lewis starts to pack up the stuff that he wants them to take with him. So he uh, packages a box uh, destined for the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. And it the box contains skins, horns, and bones from a variety of animals that they found. And also, he builds some cages for some live animals. And what he puts in these cages, he puts four magpies, one sharp-tailed grouse, and the prairie dog. So on April 7, 1805, the following spring, the cargo left Fort Mandan on the keelboat headed for St. Louis. It arrives in St. Louis. All the specimens are still alive. The four magpies, the one grouse, and the one prairie dog. They then go down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. Um, when they get to New Orleans, the sharp-tailed grouse has apparently died because it's not recorded as a writing. So they had the four magpies and the prairie dog. From New Orleans, the cargo is then shipped to Baltimore, Maryland, where it arrives on August 12, 1805. By the time it gets to Baltimore, uh, three of the magpies have died, but there's still one magpie and the prairie dog is still alive. On October 4th, the, prairie, the magpie, oh, yeah, October 4th, the magpie and the prairie dog arrive in D.C. President Jefferson comes to see him and wants to look at him because this is the kind of scientific discoveries that he's interested in. And he looks at him and he's pretty amazed. And when he's done looking at him, October 22nd, the prairie dog and the magpie find, go to their final destination, which is a museum in Philadelphia. Well, it seems, according to the records, that the magpie died sometime over the winter from 18, between 1805 and 1806. But the prairie dog, the last recorded the last record they have of the prairie dog was April 5th, 1806, and it was still alive. So this prairie dog went all the way from North Dakota, down the Missouri, down the Mississippi, to St. Louis, to New Orleans, to Baltimore, to Washington, D.C., and then to Philadelphia, and it survived the whole time. And this is amazing just because it lived that long, but also because these people weren't expert animal handlers. They didn't know anything about their habits, what they ate, what they drank, anything like this. And so they just continued to feed it. Apparently, they kept, it fe kept feeding it grasses and leaves and things, which is what they wanted. But the other interesting, interesting thing that they found out was prairie dogs don't drink water. They gave it water, but it wouldn't drink water. And so they, just, they get all the moisture that they need from the, from the grasses and the leaves that they eat. And so again, it's part of the scientific discovery that came out of the uh, finding and keeping the prairie dog. So the core itself had wintered in uh, on the Pacific coast, and they returned to St. Louis, September 23rd, 1806. And the various, uh, the volumes of the journal entries made by the members of the core indicates all the new and wondrous sites that they had witnessed. But when comparing, all, when comparing these observations, and there's a lot of them, there's a lot of, you know, they found a lot of stuff, a lot of new geologic features, a lot of rivers, a lot of rapids, uh, just different things they had never seen before. But it, when you compare this one entry of the, concerning the tower with all the others, this one entry becomes, the, the importance of it becomes very obvious because the scientific value and the, and the uniqueness of the tower uh, it, there's nothing else like it in all the journal entries. Again, Clark describes the dimensions of the tower, um, and again, 70 feet higher than uh, the surrounding uh, the surrounding terrain, uh, which makes it very imposing. And again, notes that it was about five and a half miles, so you could see it quite a ways. And also that they were the site of this imposing tower uh, compelled Lewis and Clark to explore it. And then, of course, once they stopped to explore it, that's when they found the Prairie Dog Town. Um, and the Prairie Dog, the magpies, and the grouse were the first specimens, animal specimens, 
that were sent back east from west of the Mississippi River. So none of, this, uh, none of these had ever been sent back east before. And so this is totally new to the scientific community um, in the east. So this type of zoological find by the core was rare. Uh, the core's journey between the Niobrara and the Teton Rivers, again about 260 miles, proved from a zoological standpoint the most enlightening. But it's, again, it's the combination of this geologic feature, again, one of the few like this on their entire trip, the combination of the, of the uh, geologic feature and the scientific, the zoologic feature, the prairie dog, never in any of their journals did they find this combination again on their entire trip. <coughs> Nothing where you have an unusual uh, geologic feature along with a zoological feature. Again, never in their entire journal did you find this kind of entry. So this is indeed a very rare combination. Uh, the tower is still, again, a picture of the tower. The tower is still a distinguishing landmark. And just like Lewis and Clark, after descending this base, you can still find a prairie dog town uh, about a half mile away from the base of the, of the tower. So again, visible from a long ways away, much as Lewis and Clark had seen it. And if you go there, uh, you can still find a prairie dog town as well. And that's it. Questions or comments? Yes. In today's context, we do uh, tell us in terms of the Bays County villages and highways and all where this is and what's the accessibility to it? It's near Lynch in Boyd County and it's on private property. You could see it if you go into South Dakota. I bet you could probably see it if you're looking across, it's looking south from the highway there. Or if you have access to, if you can get to the Missouri River from South Dakota, to, if you can get to the Missouri River bank from the South Dakota, you could see it. It's just that where it sits now, it's all on private land and it sits far enough back from the highway that you cannot see it. Well, I think they're kind of cute. <laughs> well, they have, they obviously have a problem with them, so. Uh, there's, I, I, I know that there's ways to control the spread of prairie dogs, so. What do they do? Well, they eat, they eat a lot. And so they eat up a lot of the ground vegetation. So if you're a rancher, people don't like them for that reason because it eats up a lot of the vegetation. And also, cattle will fall into, hole, fall into their holes and break legs. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem as well. So there's reasons that ranchers don't like them. But they shoot a few of them. No, they're not an endangered species. No. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They must have known about this Ford Mandan up there. How? That, there had been Euro-American explorers, fur traders, that had gone up to Fort Mandan. Okay. And, but that was the last place that, that was the furthest west that oh. most, that they knew anything of. So once they leave Fort Mandan, they're, they're on their own with the help and guidance of Native American tribes. No, it's a, it's a clayish kind of limestone. How, how much is the erosion in, like, say, for a year, five years, ten years? Well, we saw a picture of it of, from about 40, 50 years ago, and I'm going to guess that it was probably... 10 to 15 feet higher than it is now. Is it the winds or the rains or the combination that's uh, reducing it? Combination. 
it's pretty it's pretty sturdy but you know over time and and the other problem is again the lack of vegetation so it doesn't there's nothing to, there's no roots to hold it to hold the the material there no solid Any questions comments okay thank you very much